praise God. Matthew chapter 18 and verse 21. I thought of titling this message today something like this. Maybe this is the most difficult message you'll ever hear. It's a bit long for a title, so I went with a different title. And I'll tell you that in a second. Matthew 18 verse 21. Has everyone got it in their Bibles? If, if you, you've got someone next to you that doesn't, just share your Bible with them. Then came Peter to him and said, Lord, how often shall my brother sin against me and I forgive him? Till seven times? How often should my brother sin against me or offend me and I forgive him? Well, what's the limit? Seven times? Jesus said unto him, until seven times? No, but until 70 times seven. Everyone say 70 times seven. I don't believe Jesus was saying 490 times. He was just saying, you know, basically never ending. Just keep forgiving. Therefore, the kingdom of heaven is likened unto a certain man which would take account of his servants. So Jesus began to teach by a parable about this man who had some servants. And when he had begun to reckon, he began to take the accounts, one was brought to him that owed 10,000 talents. Now I believe one talent is around $23,000 or 30,000 Australian dollars. But for as much as he had not to pay, his Lord commanded him to be sold. He couldn't pay the debt. So the owner said, sell him, sell his wife and children and all that he have so that payment can be made back to, back to me. The servant therefore fell down and worshipped him saying, Lord, have patience with me and I will pay you all. The Lord of that servant was moved with compassion and loosed him and forgave him the debt. Everyone say forgiveness. He forgave him of the 10,000 talent debt. Wow, that's amazing. So what did the same servant do? Well, he went out and found one of his servants. He went and found one of his servants, which owed him not 10 talents, but owed him a hundred pence, basically nothing. And he laid hands on him. He took him by the throat and he said, pay me what you owe me. <laughs> oh, and his fellow servant fell down at his feet and besought him saying, have patience with me and I will pay you all. And he would not. So he cast him into the prison till he, the debt should be paid. So when his fellow servant saw what was done, they were very sorry. And they came and told unto their Lord all that was done. Then his Lord, after that he had called him, said unto him, O wicked servant, I forgave you all of your debt. I forgave you all of your debt because you asked me, you desired it of me. Shouldest thou not also have compassion on your own servant, even as I have had pity on you? Can you, you get the story? This man was forgiven 10 talents by his master. Then this guy goes to his servant and he wouldn't forgive him a hundred pence. He grabs him by the throat, throws him in prison. His Lord was wroth, wroth and delivered him to the tormentors till he should pay all that was due unto him. So likewise shall my heavenly Father do also unto you, if you from your hearts forgive not every one his brother their trespasses. So likewise shall my heavenly Father do also unto you, if ye from your hearts forgive not every one his brother their trespasses. I told you that I was gonna almost call this message. This may be the most difficult message you will hear. But instead, I'm just gonna call it forgiveness. Everyone say forgiveness. Let's pray that Lord would speak to us through the Word today. Lord, we love You. We thank You, Lord, that we are here. We thank You for Your Word. Lord God, I pray, Lord, that our hearts would be open to receive and our ears open to hear. And Lord, that we would not just be hearers of the Word, but doers of the Word. We thank You for the freedom. Lord God, we thank You for the power of forgiveness today. And Lord God, speak to our hearts. Set people free, Lord God. I pray this all in Jesus' Name. And everybody say Amen. Everybody say Amen. amen. You may be seated. Praise God. Forgiveness. Forgiveness brings freedom. Everyone say freedom. freedom. We sang about freedom. We talked about freedom from the law of sin and death. But forgiveness brings freedom. We are free because Jesus forgave us. But we can also become free by forgiving others. Everyone say forgiveness. You see, 
We've all been on both sides. We've all been on both sides. What do you mean by that? Well, we've all needed to be forgiven and we've all forgiven. We've all forgiven other people and we've all been forgiven by other people. And, and forgiveness is central, central to human relationships. Forgiveness, as I'll show you in the Word of God today, is central to our walk with God. It is important in our walk with God. And so over our, the last uh, two weeks, we've started a new series about the kingdom. Thy kingdom come. It's been our midweek Bible study. And, and the reality here for us today is that there are two competing kingdoms in this universe. Two competing kingdoms. The kingdom of this world, everyone say the world, which is dominated by Satan and the kingdom of God. The kingdom of this world and the kingdom of God. And Jesus said Himself in John 18 verse 36, He said, My kingdom is not of this world. In other words, He said, My kingdom is not this worldly system. I'm from a different kingdom. I'm, I'm the king of a different kingdom. And so the kingdom of God contrasts the kingdom of this world. And it's not just a simple contrast between bad and good. It's not just a, a simple contrast between good and evil, but it is the, the, the contrast between the two kingdoms, the kingdom of this world and the kingdom of God is two fundamentally different ways of living. Two fundamentally different ways of living. Two fundamentally different mindsets. Two fundamentally different belief systems. There is two kingdoms contrasted in this world. The kingdom of the world and the kingdom of God. And so Jesus made it clear. He said, my kingdom is not of this world. You see, we hear often preached about, uh, you know, the world and all those sort of things. But I'm here to preach about the kingdom of God. And the kingdom of, of God is different to the kingdom of this world. You see, in the world, we talk about behaviour modification. We talk about turning over a new leaf. We talk about a, a, a new start, like making some changes. That's the way of the world. But in the kingdom of God, we talk about being born again. Everybody say born again. Not just turning over a new leaf, but a completely new life. To be born again, that is the way of the kingdom. And we praise God for the baptisms we're going to have today. The kingdom of God is different to the kingdom of this world. You see, in this world, it's about whoever can climb to the top. Is the greatest. But in the world, in the, in the kingdom of God, Mark 9, verse 35 says, You become great by being a servant of all. That's the kingdom of God. In the kingdom of this world, you got to go, you got to try and achieve, you got to be ambitious, you got to lay hold of things and take it in your hands and, and fight. But in the kingdom of God, if you lose your life for Jesus' sake, you, you find it. In this world, if you find your life, you lose it. In this world, it's a tit for tat. In other words, it's an eye for an eye. If you hurt me, I'll hurt you. And if I can't hurt you now, I'll wait and I'll get revenge. You see, there was a man in hospital once. He got bitten by a dog. He was dying, by, dying of rabies. And he's in the hospital. Everyone told him you're going to die soon. And so he asks for a pen and paper. He takes the pen and paper and he begins to, to, to write some things. And the doctor says to him, he goes, what are you writing? It's, he goes, I, I guess you're writing your will because you're going to die. He, and he's taking the pen. He goes, it's so good to see that you're preparing for your death and writing the will. And the man who was dying from rabies says, no, no, I'm not writing a will. I'm writing a list of all the people that I'm going to bite before I die. You see, in this world, it's about revenge. It's about tit for tat, eye for an eye. But in the kingdom of God, the kingdom of God is not about revenge. It's about forgiveness. Everyone say forgiveness. And so what is forgiveness? Forgiveness is to release a person from a debt. Forgiveness is to release a person from an obligation that has been occur incurred against you. To forgive someone means to release a debt or an obligation that has been incurred. It is a choice. Everyone say a choice. It's a choice that we make to forgive. A, we forgive somebody that has wronged against us. It's a choice. Now, it doesn't mean because you forgive them that you approve what they did. It doesn't mean because you forgave them that you agree that what they did was okay. 
No, it doesn't mean when you forgive someone that, that you're justifying or pretending that you're not hurt. Yes, you, you can very real, uh, the hurt is very real. Everything you're experiencing is very real. No, that, that's not it. No, it doesn't mean that you're not hurt when you forgive somebody. It's releasing. It's releasing by choice. Somebody who has offended you. Somebody who has a debt incurred against you. I'm talking about forgiveness. Now, it's important to realise, very important to realise that forgiveness does not necessarily mean reconciliation. Forgiveness does not necessarily mean reconciliation. That doesn't mean because I forgive someone that next week we're going to go on holidays together. There's a difference. We can strive, and I encourage everybody, to forgive and to strive for reconciliation. Yes. But even if reconciliation doesn't happen, forgiveness can still happen. Forgiveness can still happen. One may lead to the other. Forgiveness may lead to reconciliation, but one is not the other. Forgiveness and reconciliation are two things. Another thing we must remember is that forgiveness and trust are two different things as well. I may go to Brother Often's house and he had a $50 note sitting on the table and we were having a cup of tea and I said, Brother Often, you want to, can I get some sugar to put in my cup of tea? And when he went to get the, the sugar for my cup of tea, I took the $50, put it in my pocket. Brother Arthur, after I go home, he rings me, he says, Pastor, when we were having a cup of tea, there was $50 on the table. And uh, did you take it? Ah, oh, yeah, sorry. Sorry, Brother Arthur, please forgive me. Yeah, okay, I forgive you. So he, there's reconciliation. So he invites me back again and he puts the $50 there again and I take it again. Oh, Brother Arthur, I'm so sorry. Can you forgive me? He says, I forgive you. But you know what he's thinking in the back of, the, back of his mind? He's not coming for a cup of tea again. <laughs> He's forgiven me. But trust is earned. Forgiveness can happen in an instant. But trust is earned. And so forgiveness is very important. We cannot ignore forgiveness. It's mentioned even twice in the Lord's Prayer. Forgiveness is what the cross is all about and Christianity is all about. It's central to human relationships. It's central to our relationship with God. Forgiveness is so important. It is necessary for salvation. Forgiveness brings freedom. Everybody say freedom. Now, there's a lot of misunderstandings about forgiveness. Some people think forgiveness is to just sweep it under the carpet, to just gloss over it or forget about it. No, when, when there is forgiveness, it's not simply overlooking someone's transgression. You see, when there is an offence, there is a debt that must be paid and the debt does not go away. That person incurred a debt or an obligation against you. Okay, so there is a debt. Somebody always has to pay. And so Jesus didn't just overlook our sins. He didn't just sweep our sins under the carpet. But He died and paid the price for our sins. I've told this story before and I'll tell it again. But there's a story about, I like to make it up with someone's name, but I won't do that today. But let's, let's just use myself. I was driving along and, and for some reason I was blessed enough to have a beautiful black shiny BMW. Low profile tyres, a spoiler on the back, had a turbo so when I drove, had a big stereo, you know, everyone was looking at me, you know. I pull up at the lights, everyone's looking at my low profile tyres, you know, I was able to drive off from the lights, Mm, you know that shh, that turbo make? I don't even know what it is, but it sounds cool. <laughs> I used to love driving that car. I was proud to drive that car. Life was good when I was driving that car. But one day I was down here at Melrose Drive and I was parked there, just feeling good about my car. Next thing I know, uh, bang, straight into the back of my car. Oh, I'm jerked forward like I had my seatbelt on. I looked in the revision mirror and I see... The oldest, ugliest car you've ever seen. It's got dents all over it. I look into the driver's seat. And there's a little old lady sitting in there. All I can see is white hair. I get out of the car. I'm looking at my car. It's all smashed up. And she makes her way out of her car. And I find out that she's a retired missionary. She doesn't have any possessions. 
She doesn't have any insurance. She doesn't have any money. So the goodness of my heart, I say, well, okay. Forget it. I'll take care of the damage. I'll take care of it. I'll take care of it. That is what forgiveness is. There is a debt. that Now my car is smashed. But for it to be fixed, it's going to cost someone something. And so in forgiveness, we are saying, I will pay the price for the forgiveness. Now I got another choice. I could just keep driving around in that car. And a lot of people do this with forgiveness. They keep driving around in a smashed up car, waiting for somebody who is never going to be able to change the situation, who is never going to be able to pay. It's never, and they're driving around in a smashed up car, hoping that one day this person's going to make everything right. And some people are waiting for people that are even dead to make it right. It's never going to happen. But they just keep driving around in a smashed up car. You can see it on their face. You can see it in their relationships with other people. You can see it in their sleepless nights. They're driving around and what used to be so good, now they're so ashamed, they're feeling so damaged. Why? Because they're, they're waiting for somebody else to make it right. But forgiveness says, yes, there has been an offence. Yes, there is an obligation that must be satisfied. And that deficit doesn't just evacuate into thin air. Forgiveness means there a price must be paid. And for my car to be fixed, I'm going to have to do that. I'm going to have to forgive them. And so many people waste years of their life with bitterness, with resentment, when they could, when they could, when they could have the power and the freedom of forgiveness. Yet they're wasting years and years of their life. Why? They're waiting for somebody else to fix it up. They're driving around in a smashed up car when through forgiveness, they could have lived that life in joy. I'm talking about the freedom of forgiveness. People suffer stress, anxiety, pain, depression, and doctors can link a lot of it to unforgiveness. Unforgiveness is a toxic thing to have. Often when you go to farms, and I, I go to farms a little bit, when you go to a farm, you often see a working dog, especially if they've got cattle or sheep. They have these working dogs and they cost a lot of money. But, or, or sometimes farmers will have a guard dog. If you've got a big property, you want to know that if someone's on your property, the dog's going to bark. But you often see these guard dogs and they'll have their kennel, like a, like a, a, little, a little metal kennel, and, and they'll have the dog chained up. And the dog's chain is connected to the kennel and then connected to the collar of the dog. And so the dog can go a little distance from the kennel, but it can only go so far. Even if, even if the dog wants to run, it can only go so far and, and the chain is going to yank the, yank the dog back. And the same is with unforgiveness. A lot of people have a spiritual collar around their neck. And the links of that chain are, are anger and bitterness and resentment and re revenge and hatred. And all of those links are in a chain connected to a collar called unforgiveness. And it doesn't matter what they do because they're chained by unforgiveness. They try, but they can only go so far. And they try to have a, be a better relationship with, with their kids or their husband or, or their relatives. They try, but they're always just yanked back because of unforgiveness. But I want to tell you today, when we forgive, there is freedom in forgiveness. There is power when we release somebody from our offences. And Jesus told us that we ought to forgive our brother. We ought to forgive our sister. We ought to forgive others if we want to be forgiven ourselves. Everyone say Amen. amen. And so maybe, maybe somebody here today needs to forgive. Maybe you know somebody that needs to forgive. And I know that God wants us to forgive because there is freedom in forgiveness. If you've got unforgiveness in your life, you are not living the life that God intended for you. We read it in the Bible already. And so Jesus told us, He said it's impossible that you can get through life without some sort of offence. He said it's impossible that you're not going to be offended. Luke 17 verse 1, Jesus made it clear. He said it is impossible, but that offences will come. And so here, here is a guarantee, a money back guarantee. <laughs> You're not going to be able to get through life without offending someone or being offended by somebody. So if, if it is a guaranteed result, if I told you that there's a 100% chance of rain, you'd take an umbrella, wouldn't you? Yeah? 
And if I told you that there's a 100% chance that Jesus, Jesus told us there's a 100% chance that you're going to be offended, then you would make sure that you had a system of forgiveness to forgive. And so here's the bottom line. Here's the bottom line. And listen carefully. If you don't forgive others, God cannot forgive you. And if you have unforgiven sin in your life because God cannot forgive you, then you are a sinner and you will not go to heaven. I'm going to say that again and then I'll give you a scripture. If you don't forgive others, God cannot forgive you. If you have unforgiven sin in your life, then what's that make you? A sinner. And sinners have their no place in heaven. Matthew 6, verse 14 and 15. If you forgive men their trespasses, if you forgive, your heavenly Father will also forgive you. But if you forgive not men their trespasses, neither will your Father forgive your trespasses. And so make no mistake, church. Make no mistake. Forgiveness is very important. One man once said this. He said, unforgiveness is the unforgivable sin. Because if you have unforgiveness, you cannot be forgiven. And so unforgiveness, like all the other things that we read about, adultery and dissension and, and hostility and quarrelling and idolatry, all of those things, the works of the flesh, they're all sin as well, but so is unforgiveness. And so I want to stop right here and, and address something because a lot of times we misunderstand. If, if somebody commits a crime against my person, an assault, of any kind, a, a crime against my person or my property, should I just forgive and forget and not involve the police? Now, I'm, I'm talking about something very sensitive and guiding you today. Should I just forgive and not involve the police? And some people would say, oh, yeah, you just forgive them and just let them go. It doesn't matter if they've, if they've done an offence against your, your person or your property. Forgiveness, when we forgive somebody, we're releasing the offender from the personal and emotional offence against us. I am releasing them. However, if a crime, everyone say a crime. If a crime has been committed, the offender has broken the law of the land. That's not the sort of stuff you'd normally hear in a pulpit, but I feel led to say this. If a crime has been committed, the offender has broken the law of the land. And while you may have forgiven them for the personal and emotional hurt that has happened against you, forgiveness does not supersede the law of the land. The course of justice must still take place, even though you have forgiven them. You've released them from your own personal hurt, but they have broken the law. And so even when God has forgiven us, even when God has forgiven us, we also have to go with the consequences of the law of the land. Had a, had a young guy once, he, he came to the Lord. God did a wonderful work in his life. He was saved. And, but then six months after coming to the Lord and being forgiven of all his sins, the police found some fingerprints of something that he had done previously. And so he had to go back to jail for a couple of more months. Even though God had forgiven him, he still had to suffer the consequences under the law. Romans 13, if you want to read it, tells us that God puts authority in place. God puts authority in place. And so reporting a crime against yourself or your property shouldn't be done with hatred or revenge, no. But it should be done because they have done a crime and they have broken the law. And so the Bible explains that God's justice is revealed in two ways. First of all, His justice is revealed through the law of the land and He puts authority in place. And second, God's justice is revealed through the final judgment. So it is possible to forgive and to allow legal justice to still happen. But don't let it happen out of revenge. Now, I was, I was talking to someone about this and they said, well, Pastor, what, 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 if, what if Brother Othan stole my lawnmower and I came, home from, I came home from work and I saw him walking up the street with my lawnmower? Should I forgive him? And, and then report him to the police? Well, there's, there's a different scenario here. God say, Brother Othan, you got a chance to put the lawnmower back and then we can be, there can be restoration and then it's all good. Okay? So there is a little bit of, little bit of um, discernment there as well where things can be sorted out. Like if, if, um, if someone backed into you and they drove off but then they came back, it can be sorted out. 
But when there is, where there is a crime, you can forgive, but it doesn't mean that legal justice shouldn't still happen. And the reason why there's a lot of trouble and a lot of hurt in this world is because people didn't understand that. They were told, forgive and forget. And offenders just keep moving around, keep doing the wrong thing all the time. And so we must understand we owe a duty of care to other innocent people. Man, we've gone deep today, haven't we? All right. Many people are hindered by unforgiveness. Everyone say unforgiveness. And so even if a person hasn't asked for forgiveness, we can decide to forgive. Why? We say, I don't want to be held hostage anymore by this unforgiveness, by this bitterness and resentment. I don't want to be held hostage anymore. Even if they don't ask, you can still forgive them. You see, forgiveness can be unilateral, which is one way. Or it can be transactional, where where it is both ways. Sometimes you can forgive somebody that's even passed from this world. You're releasing them from the hurt. Either way, we must forgive. Why? Because God has forgiven us. And unless we forgive, the Bible says, God cannot forgive us. And so the devil will come with his most popular poison and he uses this against the children of God all the time. He will he would allow an offence and then he will cause us to become offended and to begin to harbour unforgiveness and resentment and hatred. And let me tell you, unforgiveness is a toxic poison that doesn't destroy anybody else. It destroys its own container. There is freedom in forgiveness. How many Kenyans have we got here today? How many Kenyans? If you're a Kenyan, one... Two, three, four, five, six. Say, oh, brother Vincent, right in front of me, I missed you. There's about seven Kenyans here. Now you'll know this. In 1963, in fact, on the 12th of December, which is the same day we're having our family picnic, so all the Kenyans can come along and celebrate Independence Day. But in 1963, Kenya received independence from Britain. And this had been preceded by many years of violence between the Mau Mau independence fighters and the British colonial forces. The new president, Jomo Kenyatta, Jomo Kenyatta had been imprisoned by the British, wrongly imprisoned. On Independence Day, President Kenyatta addressed the newborn nation of Kenya over the radio. And maybe some of you were alive when that happened. I'm not going to get anyone to raise their hand. But he spoke, first of all, to the first British settlers. He remembered all the bad things that they had done over the years. And then Kenyatta said, but I forgive you. And then he went further and he began to outline all the bad things done by the Mau Mau independence fighters. And he concluded, he said, please forgive us. You see, Jomo Kenyatta gave Kenya a new beginning. Everyone say a new beginning. He gave them a new beginning and, and, and a new beginning is exactly what they needed. And I want to tell you today, if you want to have a new beginning today, it starts with forgiveness. If you want to have a new beginning, it starts with forgiveness. And so did forgiveness reverse all the wounds? No, there were still wounds, but it does bring freedom to move forward and Kenyatta knew Kenya needs to move forward and it can only happen and it only it all starts with forgiveness he said to the British colonial settlers he said I forgive you and he and he said will you forgive us and it's just what we need today as well if you've got unforgiveness there is a new beginning for you if you would forgive he said I have suffered a prison and detention term But that is out of that, it's in the past, and I'm not going to remember it. He said, If I had wronged you, forgive me. If you have wronged me, I forgive you. Let us forgive. They're the words of Jomo Kenyatta, Kenya's first independent president. You see, unforgiveness was an impurity that Kenyatta knew had to be dealt with. It was an impurity. Everyone's saying an impurity. Turn to Matthew 5, verse 8. And I hasten. Matthew 5, verse 8 says, Blessed are the pure in heart. Blessed are the pure in heart, for they shall see God. So only the ones that have a pure heart are going to see God. And so if unforgiveness is an impurity, then we aren't going to see God if we have unforgiveness. And that word pure... It is used 27 times in the New Testament. That word pure, blessed are the pure in heart. And it's the Greek word katharos. It signifies to be clean 
and to be free from a contaminating substance. To be free and clean from a contaminating substance. And so unforgiveness is an impurity. And if we've got impurities in our heart, it says we will not see God. And so impurities will come. Jesus said, there's going to be times when you're going to be offended and you're going to be hurt and all those things. Impurities will come. But that word pure is the Greek word katharos. And it's from that word that we get the word kathara. Everyone say kathara. What are catheters used for? Catheters are used for getting toxic substance out of our body. In a, if you had a chest, a chest um, an operation in this part of your body, your chest was open, they would close your chest up and then there can be fluid and things like that building up in there. They will put something through your ribs and they will put a catheter there to drain the impurities out. And let me tell you, unforgiveness is an impurity. And if, if, if you don't have a pure heart, you will not see God. So what's it tell us? We need to have a catheter in our heart. We need to have a way to deal with the impurities of unforgiveness. We know that we're going to be offended. Jesus told us, He said it's a guarantee. There's going to come hard times. People are going to hurt us. But you've got to have a way of getting that impurity out of your system. And I want to tell you how you do that. You do that through forgiveness. I want to tell you why you do that. Because Jesus forgave us. Somebody say Amen. And so to be pure, to be pure in heart, there's got to be a constant cleansing. If you can keep your heart purged, if you can keep your heart pure, you will see God. Unforgiveness is a blockage. If you get a blockage in your bowel, if you get a blockage in your urinary urinary system or something like that, it begins to show on your face. It begins to show in your eyes. And the same is with unforgiveness. It begins to show in your life. It begins to show in your relationships. It begins to show in your health. Forgiveness shows the world the kingdom of God. Everyone say the kingdom of God. When you forgive, maybe in your workplace, someone's hurt you. And everyone hates them or they've done something crazy. Everyone hates them. But when you forgive, you're showing the world some insight into the kingdom of God. Because the kingdom of this world says tit for tat, eye for an eye, revenge for revenge. But when you forgive, you show the world the kingdom of God. You show them the ways of the kingdom. And so Thomas, everyone say Thomas. Doubting Thomas. Wow. He said... When they said Jesus was risen again, he said, except I see the scars. Everyone say scars. He didn't say wounds. He said, except I see the scars, I will not believe. And I believe doubting Thomas represents his world. They are looking for marks in a Christian's life for them to believe. And when you forgive, it shows them the kingdom of God. When, when you show them your scars that are now healed, scars are wounds that are healed. And yes, we are going to be wounded. But when you show them the scars of the wound that is healed, when they see forgiveness, they see the kingdom of God. They see something that is beyond this world. They see something that is beyond our human ability. They see something that is uncommon. And they say, that is something different. And I tell you, when we forgive, we show the world the kingdom of God. We give them insight into the kingdom of God. It, killed, it, it kills me. It hurt, Jesus said. But I didn't stay dead. And when you show the world forgiveness, you say, yes, there's a wound. Yes, they offended me. Yes, I was hurt. Yes, they did something wrong. But I'm still alive. It's a scar, but it's no longer a wound. It broke me, yes but now I'm whole. And when people see that, they see the kingdom of God, they will believe and they will know. And Jesus showed them the scars, wounds that were now healed. And Thomas believed. You see, our scars tell a story. Jesus didn't come to conceal the pain. He came to reveal His glory. You see, Christianity is not just about perfection. No, Jesus showed us that from the very beginning. Christianity is not about perfection. It's not about cosmetic surgery to hide, hide everything that we've been going through. But, but when the world sees our scars, when they see the real us and everything that we've been through, and they see forgiveness, and they see restoration, and they see what God has done in our life in spite of what happened in our past, then they can believe you see forgiveness shows the world something supernatural forgiveness shows you know you can be an evangelist to somebody else by forgiving they say how did you do that how did you do that God gave me the grace to do it 
God help me do it. As I finish the story about Corrie Ten Boom, you've not, you probably know about her. Read stories, and I like to tell stories about her as well. But she was arrested by the Nazis along with the rest of her family for hiding Jews in her home during the Holocaust. She was imprisoned, and eventually, Corrie Ten Boom and her sister were sent to Ravensbrück, or Ravensbrück, a concentration camp. She was there with her beloved sister Betsy, who perished there just days before Corrie was released on December 31, 1944. Her sister died there in that concentration camp. Inspired by Betsy's selfless love and inspired by Betsy's forgiveness, amid all the cruelty that was happening in that concentration camp, amid all the persecution, Corrie decided that after the war, that she would go and she would become a minister and tell people about forgiveness. She was there, she said, uh, she established this home for, for camp survivors to be able to recover from all of the horrors that they had escaped. And so she went travelling widely as a missionary, preaching God's forgiveness, preaching about reconciliation and, and Corrie's devout moral principles were tested. Everyone say tested. Here she is preaching, but now she's going to be tested. When she came face to face with one of her former tormentors in 1947, after a speech in a church in Germany, a man came to her. He said, Corrie, you mentioned Ravensbrück in your talk. I was a guard there. But since that time, I have become a Christian. I know that God has forgiven me, Corrie. I know that God has forgiven all the cruel things that I did in that place. But I would like to hear it from your lips as well. Fraulein, his hand came out. Will you forgive me? She's now face to face with one of her tormentors from the concentration camp, a guard, a Nazi guard, now a Christian. Corrie, Fraulein, will you forgive me? And Corrie writes in her book, I stood there. I whose sins had every day been forgiven and I could not. Betsy died in that place, she said. Could I erase her horrible, terrible death simply because somebody asked me to do it? It could not have been many seconds that I stood there. It wasn't very long that, I had, that his hand was held out, but to me it seemed like hours as I wrestled with the most difficult thing I ever had to do. And I stood there with the coldness clutching my heart. And then I remembered, forgiveness is not an emotion. Forgiveness is an act of the will. And the will can function regardless of the temperature of the heart. Your will can function regardless of how you feel. And so she said, Jesus, help me. And she prayed silently. She said, I can lift my hand. That's as much as I can do, Jesus. And so she wrote, and so woodingly, mechanically, I thrust my hand into the one who had stretched his hand out to me. And as I did, an incredible thing took place. The current started in my shoulder. It raced down my arm, sprang into our joined hands. And then this healing warmth seemed to flood my whole being, bringing tears to my eyes. And Corrie looked at that Nazi guard and said, I forgive you, brother, with all my heart. For a long moment, we grasped each other's hands, the former guard and the former prisoner. She said, I have never known God's love so intensely as I did at that moment. I want to tell you, there is freedom in forgiveness. There is freedom in forgiveness. And wherever you are today, I want to tell you, your way to freedom is through forgiveness. Maybe someone's hurt you. Maybe just in the last week or so, you've come face to face with a tormentor or somebody that has hurt you in the past. Maybe you're holding on to things that you ought not even been holding on to. Maybe something so small has become so big because you refuse to forgive. You see, you can go climb a tree and get a splinter in your finger. Just a splinter. Just a splinter. A small speck of wood. Climb that tree. If you take it out, 
It's nothing. Done. Gone. But if you leave it there, it begins to fester. It can become infected. You can lose your finger. You can lose your hand. You can get blood poisoning. It can destroy your whole life. How did it start? With a small splinter. And maybe some of you have had a splinter at some time or other and you've allowed it to fester and fester and fester. Now it's affecting your whole life. There is freedom in forgiveness. I know, maybe I should have called this message. This may be the hardest message you've ever heard. But it also may be the most powerful message you've ever heard. It may also be the most life-changing message you've ever heard. Because right now, God is speaking a Rima word to somebody. You're in that situation. You're faced with that circumstance. You're faced with the God's hand, as it were, reached out to you right now. What are you going to do? You're going to continue to fester and stay infected? and Or are you going to allow the catheter of your heart of forgiveness to let the impurities come out? Let's all stand. You see, forgiveness is the gift that you give yourself. It's the gift that you give yourself. It's not saying, no, it's not saying they were right. They're okay. They can offend me. No, no. Forgiveness isn't saying I'll trust you forever. No. Forgiveness doesn't say go ahead and do it again. No. But when you forgive, you're saying, I cannot afford to put this much energy into being angry and bitter anymore. I've got to be free. I've got to be free. A message like this goes deep into the heart. Deep into the heart. This altar is open if you want to come and pray. But I'm also mindful that a message like this is maybe not something that you necessarily want to come and kneel at an altar. I'm also mindful that yes, forgiveness can happen in an instant like this. But I'm also mindful that someone here today might just need to receive the Word as a seed into their heart and begin to water it with faith. You see, sometimes the Word of God, and I'm speaking to somebody right now, sometimes the Word of God comes as a seed. A seed. And you can leave this place and the birds can come in and and pick it up and it's gone. You said, when I came to church, pastor spoke and I heard the Word of God and I felt the need to forgive. But then I left and forgot about it. And the devil came and the birds came and they picked up the seed and I forgot all about it. But sometimes you're going to leave this place with just a small seed in your heart. God spoke to me today and I need to do something. And then what do we do with that seed? We water it with our faith. And if you would water it with faith each day, let me tell you, you can go on the journey to forgiveness. And when you forgive, you can find freedom. Amen. Let's lift our hands all across this place as we receive what God is speaking to us right now. Hallelujah. Let God move on your heart right now. I love you, Jesus. Oh, yes, Lord. Yes, Lord. I love you, Jesus. Hallelujah. Great is your mercy towards me, oh God. Great is your loving kindness towards me, oh God. I thank you, Lord Jesus. Come on right now, just reach out to God. If God's been speaking to you, there's a, there is something you need to do in your life right now. Don't go another day. Let the impurities come out. Let the unforgiveness come out so that you can be right with God again. You don't have to be chained by that chain anymore. You don't need to wear that collar of unforgiveness anymore, restricting your movement forward. But today, if you would just forgive and release that person. Lord Jesus, we stand here today mindful, oh God, that You forgave us. Lord God, the wages of sin is death. But because of Your gift, as You died on the cross for us, oh God, We stand here forgiven. Lord God, forgiven of so much. Help us not to be like that person that went out and was forgiven so much, but then held other people accountable for their offenses and harbored unforgiveness. And so right now, God, give us the strength to forgive. Give us the faith to forgive. Give us the grace to forgive. Lord God, that person that's on our mind right now, been on our mind a long time, tormenting us day after day. The memories, oh God, help us to release them and let them go. 
Help us to release the offense and let it go. God, that we can experience the freedom and the power of forgiveness today. We love you, Jesus. Let me silence right now. We're going to worship the Lord with a song in a second, but just, just wait on the Lord. The Spirit of God is ministering. Somebody's carried a lot of hurt for a long time. God's brought this preacher today to minister a word of freedom and restoration. You can have a new beginning. New beginnings, as Kenyatta told us, start with forgiveness. Hallelujah.